Good morning, Journey family. If you are a guest with us today, my name is John. I'm a pastor here at the Journey Tower Grove, and it is my joy to welcome you to our church. And that's especially true if you do not consider yourself a follower of Jesus. It's no small thing for you to come to an unfamiliar place filled with unfamiliar people. And uh, we don't take that for granted. So thank you for taking the risk to be with us. Uh, I'm going to assume, though, that if you are here and you're taking all those risks, you're here because you're in something in the middle of your life where you are just desperate for help and for hope. And I want to invite you to bring that something into this place because all of us are in the middle of something in our lives. All of us are here because we're seeking help and hope. We're not a bunch of people who have everything together, but we believe there is a God who holds all things together and we want you to know him today. It's actually why we've titled this series In the Middle as we learn from the Lord through the book of Joshua. So before we get in and we start uh, the sermon, let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us. Our Heavenly Father, in Psalm 130, the psalmist says that our hope is in your word. Because your word tells us of a hope that is both sure and steady. It goes beyond mere wishful thinking and, and We need more than just good thoughts. We need to encounter our good God. And so, Lord, preach your word this morning. Give us your spirit so that he may reveal Jesus, your son, because it is on him that we have set our hope. We pray this in his name. Amen. Uh, Back in 2008, in the summer of 2008, uh, I took a ministry position to become a missionary. Uh, If you know anything about missions, uh, to be a missionary often means that you need to find uh, supporters who are going to walk alongside of you, partners who are going to give to you both in prayer and in finances. And we had to raise a really large amount. And for those of us who have grown up here in the States, and when we think about missions, we think about someone who's going to go far off to another country, to another place, However, I was going to be living here in St. Louis. I was going to be stationed here and then be traveling around the world to different Bible colleges, seminaries, conferences, and churches to train up ministry leaders. And as I met with individuals and families and said, hey, will you come alongside and support us? They were like, but that's not really missions. That's just you living in St. Louis and traveling. And it was a really hard concept for them to understand. Uh, To make matters even more challenging, uh, The recession hit two months later. The recession of 2008, uh, money was tight for everyone. Everyone was upside down in their mortgage, if you can remember that time. It was hard. And for two years, I toiled both in serving and in trying to raise support. And after two years, we had only had 50% of what we needed. Our family was struggling financially. It was causing stress in our marriage. It was causing stress on my heart and mind. And and there was one night I woke up in the middle of the night just overwhelmed and, and just started crying and saying, what now? What am I supposed to do now? There were all these job offers that were coming in. I said, they look so enticing. I can just get a paycheck. But the Lord was saying, I want you to stay in this place. And I looked at him and I cried out, what now? All of us have had those what now moments. All of us have had those places where we feel like we've come to a dead end and and there's no way around it. Maybe it's like our situation back then, it's financial. Maybe it's occupational. Maybe it's health related. Here's what I want you to do. You have permission to pull out your journal from the journals that you've received. Pull out your phone. Text yourself, what is the what now moment you're in right now? Just, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Go ahead, write it. Write it to yourself. Where are you saying to the Lord, what now? What am I supposed to do here? If you've got your what now moment, and I can tell some of you have it because those of us who know our what now moment, it doesn't take us long to write it down, right? We know we're in it. Here in Joshua chapters 3 and 4, 
Joshua and the very people of God are at a what now moment. They are on the precipice of entering into the promised land that God said he was going to give them. But in front of them is a gigantic obstacle. And they're asking the Lord, what now? And here, from these chapters, we want to gain a hope that is sure and steady for the what now moments of our life. First, we want to look at the assurance of God. The assurance of God. Secondly, we want to look at the accomplishments by God. The accomplishments by God. And thirdly, the abiding we have to have in God. The abiding in God. Let's first look at the assurance of God. For those of us who may have grown up in church or, or been Christians for a long time or you've read the story of Joshua, you kind of know how the story of Joshua ends. Joshua is a hero of the faith. Right? Everyone names their son Joshua because he's awesome. No one names their son Saul. <laughs> All right? It's more rare. We, we like the good characters. When was the last time you met at Ahaz? Not very regularly. But everyone's named Joshua. By the way, if your name is Joshua, we're not trying to say your name is common or unimportant. Okay? Joshua was a hero of the faith because we know how the story ends. But if you were there in that time, Joshua is not this great hero that everyone knows about. Joshua is just a regular guy. In fact, he feels insignificant and insecure. He was born a slave in Egypt. He was merely a witness to the miracles of God. He was called Moses' assistant. Even when Joshua won all these great military battles, someone else's work got more credit. Joshua didn't campaign to be the leader of God's people. Joshua didn't ask for it or apply for the job. God set Joshua as the leader for his people. And Joshua feels so insignificant and so insecure that when God finally speaks to Joshua for the first time, what does he tell him? He tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. And he has to say it to Joshua three times. Three times he repeats those words, you be strong and courageous. And Joshua hears from God and comes down and starts talking to the very people of God. And even some of God's people have to tell him for a fourth time, be strong and courageous. Joshua doesn't always feel like a leader. Here in this passage, Joshua's not sure what he's doing. And here they are in this culminating moment. 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and they are now on the bank of the Jordan River, and they see across it the very promised land that God said he was going to give to them. But in their way is a raging river. And the question that's being asked by all of God's people to Joshua is what now? What now? Joshua doesn't know what to do, but God does. Look with me, verse 7 of chapter 3. The Lord speaks to Joshua saying, The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses... So I will be with you. This is really important. To exalt someone is to dignify them in the presence of others with power and position. And what does God say? I will exalt you. I will exalt you, Joshua. Joshua doesn't have to exalt Joshua. God's going to do it. And when God exalts Joshua, people are not going to see how great Joshua is. They're going to see how great God is. But we live in a world where we're so busy trying to exalt ourselves, aren't we? Our whole political system is about that. Even how we apply for jobs is about that. This is my fourth ministry uh, position I've held as a pastor. And you have to apply uh, to these things like you do in the regular world. And so you write these things that we all love to write, right, called resumes. And you fill it out and you send it in. A second Corinthians 12, uh, in it, the Apostle Paul says that we are to boast gladly in our weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon us. Guess how many lines of my resumes talk about my weaknesses? None. Okay? None. It's, 
It'd be so odd to see that. We tout ourselves and we toot our own horn. We try to tell everyone why we should be a leader who is worthy to be followed. When I write my resume, I write my skills, my successes, my strategy. I don't write about my sin, my struggles, or my failures. None of us are immune to that. It doesn't matter if you're applying for a pastoral job or any job. It does not matter. We live in a world that has conditioned us to always show how good we are. Why we deserve power. Why we deserve position. Why we deserve to be exalted. Can I read some verses from Scripture uh, that's going to be a little stark for us? Psalm 138 verse 6 says, For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty... He knows from afar. Matthew 23, 12, the very words of Jesus. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. James 4, 6, therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Are you noticing a theme here? Joshua does not need to exalt himself. God says, I will begin to exalt you. God says, I will be with you. Joshua's assurance that all things will work out is not because of how great he is, but because he has a God that is greater than anything and everything in this world. Where does your assurance lie, church? Do you believe that God cares for you? Joshua believed in this most stressful and stuck moment of his young leadership that God was still sovereign and supreme. In your what now moments, do you believe your God is both sovereign and supreme. Do you believe that rather than exalting yourself, you can lean on him who will exalt you? For Joshua, nothing else matters than this, the assurance he has in his God. Nothing else matters. It's actually why at the end of this, we're going to get to get into this passage a little more, but part of the verses we didn't get to read today, chapter 4, verse 14, says this about Joshua. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him as they stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. You want to know the amazing thing Joshua did to lead? He only repeated God's words. He did nothing. It's just a microphone for God's voice. But God did an amazing work. Church, Let me ask you, how often do you try to exalt yourself? In what way are you touting your strengths, your skills, your successes to gain the approval and the applause of those around you? Maybe some of you are like, I don't care about other people. I'm doing this for me. I want to know that I'm significant and I'm special. Well, for those of you who feel like I need to get the applause of others. Galatians 1.10 says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And for those of us who are trying to say, this is for me, 2 Corinthians 10.18 says, For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Church, we do not need to exalt ourselves. We do not need to take it upon ourselves to to gain power, to gain position, to strive and say, I'm going to be someone worthy of following. Rather, as we follow the Lord, he will exalt us. This is where we can trust him and his promises in those what now moments of our life. When we feel so low and when we feel so broken, our God says, I will exalt you. And even better, I am with you. Do you believe that, church? If you do, then we can have a hope like Psalm 121 talks about when it says, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? It's not in the job. It's not in the school I get into. It's not in the residency. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He is the assurance you and I need. Do you believe that? Do you believe he is your greatest assurance? 
if you have the assurance of God, then it allows you to see the accomplishments that come by God. One thing I love about living in St. Louis is this. Um, I love crossing the bridge that divides Missouri and Illinois because I think the Mississippi River is just amazing to look at. It is gigantic. I don't know how to swim very well, so I know for a fact like three feet in, I'd probably drown if I tried to swim across of it. It's huge. Actually, here in St. Louis, it's about a third of a mile wide. That's impressive. But the Mississippi is nothing compared to the raging waters of the Jordan River at flood time in Joshua's season. Uh, at that time, the, the waters of the Jordan would overflow its banks and become a violent, raging, mile-wide torrent ripping through the landscape. Can you get the sense of what stands before them a little bit? Just picture yourself standing at the Mississippi and how wide that is. Now make it three times wider. Make it ten times faster. What's God's plan? Let's look at this. God gives this plan to Joshua. He says, and as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. God's plan is this, in case you missed it. You're going to go tell your people, especially these priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, which is the representation of God's presence with his people. You're going to carry this big, heavy box, and you're going to walk into the water, and you're going to stand there. Any questions? <laughs> I've got tons. That seems like a wholly inadequate solution to the problem that's in front of us. But notice Joshua doesn't sit there and go, hold on. Replay that back. There's got to be more information than that. Joshua excitedly turns around and goes to his people and says, hey, guys, here's what we're going to do. See the heavy box that represents God's presence with us? You're going to carry it, and you're going to go into that raging river, and you're going to stand there, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and as those waters are there, Joshua says, here's what's going to happen. God is going to stop the flow of the river. And he's going to pile the waters into one gigantic heap. And we're going to walk across on dry land. How does Joshua know this? God didn't say that. How does Joshua know that this is going to happen? Because Joshua experienced it once before. Right? As he was part of the community exiting out of Egypt... The Exodus account that is so big in the lives of, of, of the Israelites is the crossing of the Red Sea. As the chariots of Egypt were chasing them down, God parted the Red Sea and they walked across it on dry ground. And Joshua remembers that. Joshua knows that when there's a body of water that stands in God's way, water loses. Here's the thing. Joshua was an eyewitness to that but only Joshua and one other person named Caleb. Everyone else who's following Joshua was born during the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They never experienced that, but they heard the stories. They heard the stories. And when Joshua says that, can you imagine the, the grumbling and the noise and the conversations that are happening? The rumbling is this. Wait, is Joshua saying God's going to do it again? Is Joshua saying that God is going to do the craziest miracle of all all over again? You mean he's going to do it for us? You mean we're going to get to see this? There's no way. But Joshua said it. He said God said it. There's no way. Yes way. And excitement grows. That talking back and forth, the call and response are the echoes of the exodus that reminds them that God did it once before. If God did it once before, then he could surely do it again. Yeah. That God was not scared of the Red Sea, and he's not frightened by the Jordan River. And they get excited. And these priests, in faith, grab the hold of the Ark of the Covenant, and they walk to the water. 
and as their feet touch the water's edge, the flow of water stops so far upstream, it's in a whole different place, and it stands there. And that riverbed that should be muddy and gross is now dry, and they make their way across. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it marvelous what our God can do? Do you think your God can't act in the situations of your life? Do you believe that your God is too small now? Like those were the Old Testament times. He's lost some of that power. Or do you believe the God who split the Red Sea and the Jordan River can create ways for you to walk through your struggles of what now? Here's the thing uh, that catches me about this passage is the the faith of these priests. Because imagine Joshua coming up to you and you're one of those priests who have to carry the heavy ark and go across. And he's like, yeah, the plan is for you to get into the water. You're going to stand there. Okay, I told you I don't swim very well. Like I'm like, I ain't going into no water. (laughs) Carry something heavy too? No way. That's a death wish. But these men are excited to do it. Here's the thing. Who gets the credit for doing the miracle? God does. Who gets the credit for doing the miracle? God does. You guys aren't paying attention. Who gets the credit for doing the miracle? Do you believe that? He gets the credit. And yet he invites his people to participate in what he's doing. It's only because the priests are willing to get their feet wet that God decides to act in that way. In your what now moments, if you're like me, we want our way, not God's way. Because our way is simple, it's easy, it's planned, right? It's comfortable. And God's way says, I want you in the middle of what you're going through to get in the middle of it. And we don't like that. We don't want to get our feet wet. It's scary to step into the unknown. It's fearful to to wander into things that are rushing and more powerful than we are. And yet God says, are you willing to get your feet wet so I can show you how amazing I am? I was telling you I was in that missionary status and I had all these offers that I could have taken that would have been so much simpler, but God kept calling me to be in that position. And so we stayed on in that missionary status for, for three more years, for a total of five years. And it wasn't until the last six months we were finally able to raise everything we needed. And after finally getting it, six months later, God called me out of that role. But the beauty of that was he provided all along the way. He provided all along the way. When we get our feet wet, we're able to see this amazing thing. See, it's not the faith of the priests that mattered. They carried the Ark of the Covenant. You know who got in that water? You know who got in that water with the priests? God did. See, God doesn't just say, you go in, I'll watch from here. This is the difference between this account and the Red Sea. At the Red Sea, Moses just simply separated his hands and raised them into the air, and the waters parted, and they walked through. The first time I heard this plan, I bet I would have said, why can't you just do that again, God? That's simple. Why are you calling me into it? But as they step in, this is the big difference. This time, God is saying, I'm not just in it with you. I'm going before you. I will make a way where there seems to be no way. I will provide the way through. Do you trust me? I've done it before. And if we here are believers in Jesus Christ, there are times we can look back in our lives and see his faithfulness again and again and again and again. And now in our what nine moments, we can say, he will make a way. He will make a way for me. And not only did God get into the Jordan with Joshua and his people, but 1,500 years later, God would get into the Jordan again. Jesus, the very son of God, would get his feet wet as he stepped into the waters of the Jordan River and was baptized by John the Baptist. And that baptism would signify and foreshadow what he would do on that cross, that for those who are so far from God, so far from the promised land of being with God, that he would make a way in and through himself 
He went before. He made the way. He paid the cost. On that cross, he did it for you and me, and now we get to be called the children of the living God. Jesus is not just in it with you. He's already gone before you. He has made the way, the ultimate way. And if he's done that, he will do anything and everything else to make everything happen. This is the beauty of the gospel, that our God doesn't just simply say, you go on ahead, I'll watch from here. But he goes before us. If you're here and you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, you may not get things about miracles. It may seem so out of your norm. But you know that place where you've said, what now? And you've tried to plan and plot and claw your way to some solution. You've asked for really good advice and you're just stuck. Can I tell you? The way of the Christian life is not to get good. The way of the Christian life is this. God calls us to be humble. Instead of you trying to exalt yourself and figure your own way out, God says, I will have a way for you. It's through my son. Give up your striving. Give up your working. Give up your, your efforts and rest in what I give. I give you life. I give you joy. I give you peace. That doesn't mean life's always going to be easy, but I will exalt you, and I am with you. This is what our God offers to you. In your what now moments, he offers you himself. And he offers you all his promises and all his power. Will you receive that invitation today? All it takes is a heart of humility that says, Jesus, I can't, but I believe you can. Christian, it's not just those who don't believe that need to believe, but you and I, we need to believe as well today. We need to believe that he is still active and at work in our lives. We need to say, Lord, in this moment, where do you want me to step? Knowing that you're there with me. Knowing that you go before me, Lord, for you, how do you want me to get my feet wet? Too often we forget what God has done. But when we look back on his faithfulness, we're able to see that he is able to do all things. This is really important, though. Too often we want to believe this lie that if we do what God wants, he's going to give us what we want. That is not the case. God does not promise that if you step in faith with him that you're going to get that promotion or that you're going to get that job or you're going to get that acceptance letter. God does not say that if you step in faith with him, that you're going to have a lavish life. God does not say that if you step into that with him, he's going to provide friends or even a girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife. This is what God promises. Himself. And for you, believer in Jesus, follower of Christ, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough for you to say, I walk in faith? Let me also say this. Our God can and do miracles. There are people in this room who should not be walking the earth right now. Okay, we've seen it. We know it. Our God heals. I'm not just saying that because it sounds really cool from this stage. I'm saying it because it's true. I've seen it in the life of our church. But miracles are miracles because they're not normative. If they happened all the time, they're no longer miracles. And I hear so many of us praying to God, give me a miracle, give me a miracle. Let me tell you, he doesn't have to give you a miracle. He gave you the Messiah. Miracles are great, but they are not the way we find if God is being faithful to us. God is faithful to accomplish his promises for his people, and sometimes he does it through miracles. Okay? So we can pray for miracles, but don't hang your hat on that. Hang your hat upon the one who died for you. If he made a way that way, what will he not do for you? Right? If our God can die for you and forgive your sins or part the Jordan River, which is greater? If you're not so sure what the answer to that question is, he did both. He did both. 
And if we have this kind of assurance in our God and we can see the accomplishments our God has given us by himself and through himself, then we can abide in that God. We can abide in the God who, who is so worthy of our trust. Uh, my family lives on the East Coast, my extended family, so we travel out to the East Coast for holidays or vacations. Uh, but whenever we travel back, uh, as we cross uh, from Illinois into Missouri, we love looking at the Gateway Arch, right? Like, I don't know what it is about it, but we would like drive back and it doesn't matter if it's night or day, like at night when it's all lit up, we're like, it's beautiful. And we take pictures, it never shows up, right? <laughs> and at daytime, the sun is glistening on it, it's so bright and we're like, it's shiny, right? The arch is awesome to me, right? It, it, it tells me I'm home, it tells me we're back. Uh, and, and, and the arch is there to serve as a, a memorial to remember why we're here today. When we have physical buildings like that, now again, I lived in the D.C. area, so the D.C. area, we have monuments and memorials all over the place, right? Like, we do that to celebrate and commemorate. It's for that very same reason God commands Joshua to take 12 men and to take 12 stones out of the riverbed of the Jordan. Okay, again, part of the plan, weird, right? Like, tell, take 12 rocks and carry it out. Like we're trying to get across. It doesn't matter. Take those rocks. And they take it. And they take it to their campsite and they stack it on top of each other and says, God, that says this is a memorial for you to celebrate and commemorate the fact that I broke the Jordan River. I've made a way. We don't know where that monument is today. We don't know what happened to it. But can I tell you, we still have memorials today that point us back to Christ. And they're better than that memorial. Because that memorial is just stone. But the memorials we have are living and active. What are the memorials in our life that help us to abide in God? The first is this. The first is Jesus Christ himself. John 15 says, abide in me. Abide in my love. And if you do that, you'll follow my commandments and you will have joy upon joy. Do you believe that? Do you believe that in your what now moments... You actually have a God you can talk to, that you can pray to him, that he hears you. And not only does he hear you, you know what he's doing right now in heaven? He's interceding on your behalf. He's praying to the Father for you. And you can pray all the wrong prayers. You can pray all the selfish prayers, and he's going to pray the right prayer and the better prayer. Jesus says, abide in me. That's what we have to do every single day. We have to look in the mirror and tell ourselves the good news of Jesus Christ. I am a child of God, not because of who I am or what I've done, but Jesus has exalted me to that position because he has made a way for my life. If that's where I am today, nothing can stand in the way. Jesus plus nothing equals everything for me. Do you believe that? Or in your what now moments do you go, well, I don't have time for Jesus. I've got to figure something else out. Jesus is where we go to to be reminded that we need to abide in our God. But not only in Jesus, he also gives us his word. His word says this in Psalm 1-2, that the people of God love his word and they meditate, it, meditate on it day and night. Psalm 19 says that the word of God is better than, and more wanted than fine gold. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, the word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Have you noticed, though, that oftentimes in those what now moments, this is the last place we want to go. We don't meditate on this. How many times do we spend more time meditating on the problem or meditating on my feelings about that problem or meditating on possible solutions I can come up with? How many times would we say, I would trade everything for just a few more dollars? Can I ask you this? Would you rather have one more verse of the Bible or Bill Gates' riches? Do you believe that it is better than gold? We may say we do, but functionally we don't always believe that, right? Because we're always pursuing, how do I get that next little bit? How do I get just a little more? We do that with everything in this world, but we don't say, I just want just a little more of God in his word. If it's supposed to be a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path, 
Why is it that when we feel so lost and discombobulated, it's the last place we want to go to find guidance for how we ought to live? This is not words on a page. This is the living word of God. It is sharper than a double-edged sword. It separates flesh and spirit. It is breathed out by God for us to know that our God is with us. This word is alive. Church, read it. Meditate on it. Dive into it. And I know it's February. For those of you who started Bible Bible reading plans, I know we're in Leviticus, and this is where Bible reading plans go to die. (laughs) But don't give up. Because even Leviticus, if you saw its connection to Jesus, you would not want to put it down. Don't give up. Be in the word. The third is this. It's our worship together. It's our worship together. You know, we read the Bible and we say, man, these people in the Bible, they are so quick to forget. We do the same thing. Our spiritual memories are so short. It's why we need to gather every single week because I need you to remind me how great God is and you need me to remind you. And as we worship together, sing together, pray together, learn together, we get to remind one another he's worth following even in the what now moments. So church, I'm about to say this with all the love in the world. Don't show up late to the party. Don't show up late to the party. Get here early. Prepare your hearts. And if you do show up late, this is going to be hard, right? Skip the coffee line. (laughs) Because you need your Christ to awaken you more than you need caffeine. Get in. Get with his people. Be reminded in your what now moments that Jesus is with you. Fourth, fourth memorial is living a faithful life in response to God. It's faithful living. Have you noticed that when people really struggle with their faith, they're not really faithfully living the way God wants them to live? And for those people who seem to have great faith in all times, they're trying their best to faithfully live in all circumstances of life. It's logical. You pursue what you love. And it's here that Joshua chapter 4, four verse 24 says that, that the purpose of all of this is that we may fear the Lord. That, that we would follow him. Your faithful living is a, a point for you to look in the mirror and say, I'm not who I was a year ago. I'm not who I was two years ago. I'm not who I was 10 years ago. I am different because God is with me and he gives his grace to me. And because of the gospel, it is still true. I don't have to worry in the what now moment of this life. I'm going to be a little bit different tomorrow because I'm going to faithfully follow him wherever he leads. Your faithful living encourages your own heart to follow after Jesus. And lastly, it's those who come to faith because of you. You know, if you're always talking about Jesus and you're always sharing the gospel, you know what it's hard to forget? Jesus and the gospel. And when people come to faith because of you, you know, whenever you see them, it's always a reminder, like, God is at work. I've had the privilege to lead some people to, to faith in Jesus, and when I'm struggling, I look at them and they're growing. I'm able to say, in this what now moment, God is at work. He is active and he is alive. They're reminders to us that God is not done yet. Some of us are still crossing to the other side and he is part of the waters and made a way in Jesus for us. Share your faith. Proclaim the gospel everywhere you go. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Whether it is friend or neighbor or son or daughter or stranger or citizen or foreigner, share the good news. That's the very purpose here, that children would look at the memorial and say, why do we have that? And they would say, because God did something amazing. And at the end, in verse 24, chapter 4, it says that all peoples of the earth would know that the Lord, that the hand of the Lord is mighty. That's evangelism. That's mission. We want all to recognize the very hand of our God. Church, those around us that we have brought to faith because of Jesus' faithfulness remind us that he is still at work in our what now moments. And it doesn't end. This is the good news of the gospel. 
that Jesus has accomplished it all. And he gives us this assurance. And one day, all of us here are going to cross the proverbial Jordan River. And we're going to enter the promised land of God. And there we will see Jesus Christ face to face. He is the living word. And we will live lives that honor him without fail, without faltering. And there will never, ever be another what now moment in our lives because our hope will be made sight as we look at him forever and ever and ever. This is what awaits us, church. This is what awaits us. So set your hope on God. Today, in your what now moment, set your hope on God. Let's pray together. Lord, we know that soon and very soon we are going to see our king. But it doesn't always make the moments of today any less challenging or difficult. And though our hearts want to lose hope, you fix our eyes on your son and we have hope once again because he is our assurance. He has made a way in all that he's accomplished. And so we ask by the power of your spirit that you would cause us to abide in him, to remember this good news of the gospel so that our hope may not just be for a moment, but would be forever. Thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. In response to that first question we asked, uh, I want to give you some time before communion to take out the journals or that phone one more time. And to take time to journal or reflect, or pray, or meditate as you answer this question. What is the next step God is inviting you to take in response to his power and his promise. What is the next step God is inviting you to take in response to his power and promise? Let's take time to be with Jesus.